My name is Chris Gorkran and I'm a PhD student at Cambridge and I'm in the in interesting position of doing a PhD in both composition and music psychology, so half and half. Uh, but today I'd like to talk about some of my music psychology research and specifically about score dependency. So um, some consequences of what it means to play from notation all your life and develop a certain dependency on playing from notation. So, as I just mentioned, um, ultimately this really is about playing by ear versus playing from notation. Um, some of the differences and in particular how you might quantify that for, experiment, for uh, experiments. And I think the best example, perhaps even better than the one Richard just mentioned, is uh, if you ask some classical musicians to just play along and then see what happens. Uh, it has been my very subjective personal experience that some are excellent and have no problem just picking up a tune and playing along, but many actually freeze up and ask you if you couldn't perhaps notate this for them just now because, um, because they'd rather not play by ear. And I, I always thought that was very interesting because I myself have always played in bands as well as classical music. And so, as you know, in bands you primarily play by ear. And these two skills, playing by ear and playing from notation, do require different skills. They do seem to shape music cognition and certainly music practice, as just mentioned, very differently. And this talk is not there to put music notation down. It is an incredibly useful technology. But as with all technologies, if you over rely on one, it has certain consequences and you may um, not develop certain other skills that you would have developed if you relied less on this technology. And what skills exactly? That's what we're here to talk about. So in oral and written music culture, you find certain similarities, but let's talk about some of the differences. In Western classical music culture, clearly you play a lot from music notation. And as I mentioned, it is a very powerful technology for communication because it does tell you very in detail how to perform a piece of music. A composer can specify in advance what you're supposed to do. The performance is scripted. And therefore scores are highly valued, of course, in class Western classical music culture, revered even. Um, just think about all the musicology departments that would have to close if there wasn't any notation. And scripted performances are incredibly useful, especially to coordinate large numbers of instrumental performers. Uh, think of an orchestra. You couldn't possibly coordinate that many voices by ear alone. Most, even most band music, when it gets to a certain, uh, when the band gets to a certain size, uses some form of visual representation, as you can see in a lot of big band music and jazz. And therefore, notational literacy in classical music culture is incredibly important and is an integral part of a conservatory education. Now, this stands in quite stark contrast to uh, music as it has been historically played and as it is globally played, which is primarily by ear. Liliestam says the vast majority of all music ever played is played by ear. Now, it would be unfair to say that only Western classical music uses notation. There are certainly many other cultures that use notation, but it doesn't tend to be that detailed. And in fact, it seems to be more a mnemonic device. You can think of jazz lead sheets, for example, where chords and melodies are scripted, but the chords aren't written out. So the idea is that you can sort of follow the melody, but no swing is indicated, only tones and certain, certain aspects of rhythm but most of it you work out by ear. Whatever is missing, you work out by ear. So really there it's just meant as a tool for facilitating playing by ear. And again, what happens when you over rely on a particular technology, uh, also even a very powerful te communication technology as notation? I'll give you a bit of background. Classical musicians have self-reported that they have difficulty improvising and in this particular study, they said this was due to their notation-focused training at Conservatoire. And uh, certain neuroimaging studies have suggested that improvising musicians organize knowledge differently from non-improvisers. 
And it does seem that score reading musicians and improvising musicians are not sensitive to the same audio features or they have different latency times. So there does seem to be a different difference in how processing music when played from notation or when played by ear, um, how processing music uh, is done, how, what happens in the brain and what happens cognitively. Now, this study I thought was particularly interesting. Woody and Lehman in 2010 um, took classical musicians and what they call vernacular musicians, so popular musicians of, of different genres, and asked them to play melodies back to them. And the classical musicians needed significantly more attempts uh, than the vernacular musicians. And what was interesting was that the vernacular musicians thought the melodies were very predictable or typical, and the classical musicians thought they were very unpredictable or very difficult to memorize. And therefore the authors thought that perhaps there's a cognitive bottleneck for these classical musicians when they try to play by ear. That perhaps there's something that prevents them from, um, from creating the motor imagery or even the motor production mechanisms necessary for playing these melodies back by ear. That they can perhaps hear them but not quite transform that into action. And then there's another very interesting study. Um, Harris and Dijon had this neuroimaging study where they took a number of, I've actually forgotten the number now, uh, a number of pianists, um, some which according to the authors were score dependent as in played only from notation in their practice and others who would also improvise. So uh, people who would also play the organ or improvise at the organ in church. But the important difference was some could improvise and some couldn't. And there were some very different activations, particularly in the bilateral auditory cortex. That's, um, there was a very large difference there. In fact, the score dependent musicians did no, had no stronger activations than unskilled control subjects. So just to say that clearly again, the, compared to the improvisers, there was no significant difference between score-dependent musicians and people who had no musical training whatsoever when it came to these bilateral cortex activations, bilateral auditory cortex. Um, because they all could sh read sheet music, um, it wasn't surprising that they shared certain activations, particularly in the left hemisphere. But only the improvisers, again, had additional right hemisphere activations, um, particularly posterior superior parietal areas or dorsal or premotor cortex and a couple of others, but I'm just putting that here for reference. More importantly, it seems that there is a difference between these two groups. The authors found that the similarities were probably due to the fact that both could read notation and that they were all pianists and of course, uh, most pianists perform a pitch to space rotation. If you think of a score and if you think of a keyboard, you can imagine a score organizes pitch vertically and a piano organizes pitch, sorry, yes, and a piano organizes pitch horizontally. And so you make a certain rotation. But only the improvisers seem to add additional audiospatial transformations. So only the improvisers seem to have certain activations that are associated with, um, with spatial awareness. And therefore, these authors felt that the score-dependent musicians may not benefit in an, oral, in an oral learning scenario from their musical experience. So even though these are expert musicians when it comes to playing by ear, they may um, they may not be able to draw on their, expert, on their expertise. And so I asked myself, if I want to look at this experimentally, how do I operationalize score dependency? Um, same authors plus one more, Harris de Jong and Van Granenborg, talk about score dependency in the paper as the opposite of playing by ear. And so they find that if you want to assess score dependency, you should probably uh, give people improvisation tasks, harmonization tasks, or let them reproduce melodies. And that is all fine and good, but that really only measures, if you will, music or making music at the mode of, at the level of music production. 
improvising, harmonizing, reproducing, that in a, in a way focuses very much on what you, how you generate music. But I find it more interesting in how to, to look at how you learn music, because if you consider someone who plays a score by heart, at a level of music production, they're playing by heart, there's no score, and therefore they're certainly not score dependent. But if you look at uh, score dependency as a mode of music learning, then there's a big difference. There's a difference between someone who learned the same piece by ear and someone who learned it from a score and then memorized it. So, um, and of course, recognition and reproduction in, its, in themselves are prerequisites for improvising and harmonizing. And therefore, I would say score dependency is the opposite, not of playing by ear, but of learning music by ear. And now here comes the tricky bit. Isn't it true that we all learn more easily with visual media? If I don't give you a PowerPoint presentation while I'm presenting this, I think my message wouldn't come through half as well as if I give you a PowerPoint where I line, line out my ideas step by step. So really, um, there is a conceptual problem with treating score dependency as an absolute, where we say either you're dependent on your score or you're not. Because really we all make use of visual media to different degrees, and so it shouldn't be considered an absolute in my opinion. It should rather be a re seen as a relative effect. Some people rely a little more on scores and others a little less. Uh, I mentioned jazz players sometimes rely on visual representations of the tune. That doesn't mean that they don't improvise, um, but it just as a mnemonic device. Scores certainly help them. And so I wonder, how do we express this? Uh, how do we quantify this? How do we operationalize this for an experiment? So I, um, I came up with a little experiment, which I'd like to uh, share with you now. I recruited 20 classical musicians um, all over Europe. And the sample, of course, 20 is quite limited. So all my conclusions are pretty tentative. And I asked them some questions on biographical information, and musical backgrounds, and here comes the important bit. Then I played them some melodies. I had five melodies. Um, I randomized the order every time. I played them these melodies and asked them to play them back to me, just as in the other experiment by Woody and Lehman, which I described earlier. The melodies were all tonal, uh, all in 4-4, four, four, about four bars long. I wrote them myself, but I, sent, I uh, had a uh, oral and ear training professor checked them for me to make sure that they were all about um, of equal difficulty. I would always play each person the melody twice, then say what the first pitch is, and then they could attempt to reproduce it. But of course I wanted to see how much they rely on scores. So what I also did was give them a piece of paper which had some form of uh, visual representation. And there were five different conditions of for five melodies, five different visual representations. And uh, you can see them there. I'm also gonna quickly skip ahead to give you an example. The top one is the most difficult one. Uh, I wanted to control for pitch and rhythm separately. So that's what these visual representations show. The first one doesn't show any pitch or any rhythm. The second one shows you some, the density of rhythm, but not the pitch. And it doesn't show you rhythmic detail. The third one shows you the contour of the melody, but it doesn't show you any rhythm. It doesn't show you exact pitches. The fourth one shows you the exact rhythm. The fifth one shows you um, the contour with the, or it shows you the actual tones, the actual pitches. Uh, and finally, at the end, you see what the melody would have been in notation, but, that, but they never got to see that until the end. And I can give you a quick example. As I mentioned, I would play this to them twice. Um, while they had one of these representations, then I would say what the first pitch was, and then off they went. And what I was interested in measuring was how many times did they request to hear the playback again? Um, and because I didn't want to torture my poor participants after, if they requested it five more times after the two they initially got, then we called it a day and we moved on to the next one um, because 
it's it wouldn't have been comfortable for people to ask again and again and again and go crazy and hear the same melody again so if they still couldn't reproduce it after hearing it twice in the beginning and five requested times then we just went on mm. and um, the results uh, overall the differences between the different conditions were very significant and now you can have a look at the averages, how many times they request the playback. So for the basic condition where they had to find pitch and rhythm, and for the next condition, um, they needed 4.2 times or 3.8 on average. And because I ranked all these conditions, you can see that's a shared rank because those two were not significantly different from each other. I did uh, Wilcoxon tests on each pair to see if they would differ significantly. And then you see the results here. Uh, again, a shared rank for the next two conditions because they weren't uh, significantly different from each other. Although they were barely significant, not non-significantly different. So you see it was 0 0.06. So um, there might have been an effect there. And finally, uh, as you can see, that was the easiest condition. So from hard to easy, we're producing full pitch and rhythm, as you might imagine. Is much more difficult than and requires more requested playbacks that you can see in that middle column than only reducing full rhythm which people only required 1.55 playbacks on average i built a little formula um, i won't bore you with specifics but uh, i used the ranking as a weighting and then i built a little formula based on that in order to produce uh, results on a scale of one to seven and because this formula considers uh, an individual's performance across all, all the different conditions, um, each individual was awarded a position on a scale of one to seven on, in the sense of how score dependent are they. Mm, the results were 4.46 as a mean figure. Uh, and the range was 2.07 to seven, which means on a scale of one to seven, where one is very score independent and seven is very score dependent, uh, no one actually scored but in the range of one to two. But this is an overview. You can see my 20 participants on the left, um, and I've ranked them by how well they did. So the ones at the very top, they are very score independent. They required very few playbacks to play a melody back to me under different conditions. And you can see the, the five conditions there. And uh, the ones at the bottom, they required a great deal of playbacks in order to, uh, to play the melodies back to me. And remember that after five requested playbacks, I wrote down the number needs at least six. I, said, I wrote down for myself needs at least six, and then we moved on. So if you see six, that can easily indicate that, that, me, that actually indicates they needed five or more playbacks, because after five, we just went ahead. So that means they needed at least six, but could have maybe needed 10 or 12 or 15. Mm. But, Coming back to score dependency, I decided to divide my population, I'm um, sorry, my sample, into right down the middle, those who scored in the lower half of the scale and those who scored in the upper half of the scale. So those in the lower half were relatively non-score dependent or independent, and those in the upper half were relatively dependent. Um, and if I look at the non-score dependent or the in independent sample, there were no significant differences between the different conditions, and that makes sense someone who's truly score independent, uh, to them, it really doesn't make a difference what notation you give them. To them, melody, playing back melodies of equal difficulty will simply be equally difficult. And so they score very low on the scale because it doesn't matter what notation you give to them, they will use their ears regardless. Uh, so only the really extreme conditions, the one where you had to find uh, pit, all pitch, full pitch and full rhythm, and the one where you only had to find uh, partial rhythm. Only those were different from each other. But looking at the score dependent sample of musicians, there were very significant differences between the conditions, meaning that they were highly influenced by the notation that I gave to them. So that's worth a closer look. Here you have my, um, my five conditions. You can see over there on, on the left, C1, 2, 4, 3, 5. I had expected the order of difficulty to be from very difficult to very easy to be 
C12345. Apparently I was wrong. And on the right, you can see the difficulty ranking for this sub uh, this subsample. So you can see they found reproducing full pitch and full rhythm or full pitch and only partial rhythm equally difficult. In fact, they had the same mean requested playbacks. And now have a look what happens. Difficulty seems to increase with pitch content because you can see first they have to find no pitch on, under condition five. And if you go from, from uh, hard to, sorry, from easy to hard, then they had to find partial pitch, then they had to find full pitch, and then they had to find full pitch with partial rhythm and full pitch with full rhythm. And so interestingly, it's, the difficulty seems to increase with how much pitch they need to find, and only when they have to find full pitch, then whatever else they have to find or identify by ear, and not even identify, reproduce. So pitch for this subsample was harder to reproduce than rhythm. And that was not true for the score independent sample. For them, rhythm and pitch was about the same because there was no real difference between the different conditions. So what does that mean? Certainly, as you might have known before I started talking, some musicians are score dependent, some are not. Um, and this does confirm that score dependency is something relative that affects different musicians differently. You saw that my 20 musicians had very different results. You aren't just dependent or not dependent. You, some people rely on visual media more than others. And um, those who are score dependent, they find it harder to identify or reproduce pitches than rhythm by ear. Now, that's quite interesting because uh, Mills and McPherson write that you don't have to audiate pitch. You don't have to imagine pitch on certain instruments. For example, if you're playing uh, from a score and you're sitting at the piano, the score gives you a certain pitch and there's only one place on the piano keyboard where you can play it. So the pitch to space ratio is one to one, meaning you don't really need to think about the pitch if you have a good hand-eye connection or eye-hand connection rather. You see there's a C and, you're, and you've been trained to respond by playing that particular C, but you don't need to think about what does the C sound like, how does it vibrate, not like, say, a horn player who has to think about the overtones that he or she needs to produce. But rhythm, say, Mills and McPherson, must always be audiated. You can't, no matter what instrument you play, you always have to consider what rhythm you're going to play. You can't uh, automate it. You can't just hit a key and that, that's what happens. You, because it, rhythm is, um, consists of various events over time, you always have to consciously structure at that time. And so score dependency likely modulates perception or action mechanisms required for reproducing pitch. Uh, again, very small samples, and I subdivided it. So I say likely, I don't say definitely. And I wondered, did these musicians actually, actually struggle to identify the pitches by ear, or did they struggle to reproduce them on their instruments? And uh, do you remember that paper that I mentioned, Harris and De Jong, the neuroimaging study? They found significant differences between score dependent and improvising pianists in uh, the bilateral auditory cortex. And if you take those results into account, this probably means that they had difficulties perceiving pitch in a way that would allow them to reproduce them. Um, remember also that I collected some biographical information on them. And uh, when I ran some correlations, I could see that age seemed to be a significant factor, or significantly correlated, sorry, um, as was years of playing music. And remember how I talked about music notation as a technology. It makes sense if you think about how you rely on a certain technology. The longer you rely on it, the more dependent you become on it. Uh, Think of your first smartphone, how much did you, or think of your first phone, mobile phone, how much did you use that? How much are you using your recent phone? Uh, I certainly have it in my hand a lot more. You tend to rely on this aid a lot more over time. Also relevant was, or sorry, also significantly correlated was playing, uh, experience playing jazz. And again, that makes sense. If you, uh, if you play jazz, you likely play a lot by ear. And so you're better trained at that. Um, 
And then some things that weren't quite significant, so I don't know if they're worth mentioning, but perhaps because the sample was small, perhaps that would be better in a bigger sample, who knows. But improvising, experience improvising, was almost significant. And, uh, and having the ability to, uh, having an absolute pitch, which again makes sense because you can identify pitches quite easily. So I would call score dependency an expression of extreme specialization due to practice and education. If you're educated to read music very fluently, uh, you get better at it, you rely more on it, and it becomes a feedback loop. You, you simply do it more and more and more. And so you play by ear less and less. And of course, uh, I'm talking about extremes now. Most people are somewhere in between. Most people play a little bit by ear and a little bit of a notation, or it depends on where you are on the spectrum. It depends on what your musical background is, what genre you're active in. Mm. And as I mentioned, I think it's an example of relying, over-reliance on a useful technology. And therefore you lose certain skills. And so uh, my half an hour is almost up, so my final thoughts. I think it's interesting that Western classical music is, to my knowledge, the only music culture with, a, with such a detailed form of notation. And I think it's quite disturbing that when we educate young people, many conservatoires tend to focus almost exclusively on reading music rather than identifying music by ear. Um, and I had a talk with an ear training professor about that. There is a qualitative difference between ear training skills that you learn at conservatoire as in finding differences between intervals and actually being able to learn music by ear, being able to pick up pitch rhythm, uh, timbre, all sorts of other things by ear on the fly. So one might consider that this is a symptom of our Western culture of measurability, you know, where exams and how well you read something are certainly more easily assessed than exams and how easily you identify something by ear. Um, also, several studies, I'm sure you know this, have shown that rhythm and pitch are processed separately in the brain. And so it seems a score dependency seems, seems to do something that changes this mode of processing for pitch, particularly for pitch. So I would suggest a neuroimaging study. Um, and finally, my classical musicians played all sorts of instruments. And with 20 participants, I really wasn't able to separate uh, them. I actually did try to see if there was an effect for keyboard players or for wind players or string players. And there wasn't, and I'm sure if there is one, you can't identify that in 20 participants. If the number is just too small. But there are indications that uh, different instrumentalists do uh, certainly process music differently cognitively. So that might be an effect. If you think of a pianist, again, that has a one-to-one -one pitch to space ratio. That's very different from, as I mentioned before, a horn player who has to think about, okay, what, uh, what root note do I play? What overtones do I play in order to get this particular pitch? They have to um, audiate perhaps a lot more. They have to um, cognitively process pitch uh, more directly. So that might depend on, so instrument type might have an effect, visual spatial layout of the instrument, sensory motor feedback might have uh, an effect too. And that was all for me today. Thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>